Rachel and Kay here. Just wanted to catch up with my unicorns because we're in the thick of it now. I know I haven't really addressed you and we're already mostly through April, but your long runs have become egregiously long. The two days have as well. You are tired. You're a little burnt out, and if you weren't, that would be weird. Your last long run, five hours and 45 minutes, hour one, easy effort. Hour two, one by one. Hour three, easy effort. Hour four, one by one. Hour five, easy effort. It's a lot. It's a lot, and it's insane. What was I thinking? Here you go. We're not only practicing little strategies that are going to make a very, very egregiously long race feel better. There, it's about figuring out your body. And by figuring out your body, I mean a whole host of things. Fuel. Fueling is, this is why I, I kind of like inwardly roll my eyes or um, don't say anything when people talk about fueling for long runs for a half marathon. And um, if you at some point look back at your previous self and you're like, what was I thinking? Like thinking I needed to fuel for a two hour run. Now you can kind of see where I'm like, I think you'll be okay. You're going to be okay. Right? Because you guys are going to be running seven hours today alone. You are going to spend enough hours, enough time on your feet today running as you used to in an entire training week. Welcome to ultra training. So here's what I wanted, want you to get out of the day in general. So when, it come, when your legs get tired, a good way or your brain gets tired or you're just tired of doing what you're doing because it's going to be very monotonous. Um, I'm going to do what I can to break up that monotony for you. But what my, my power is still very limited. So, I mean, I can only be there present and dancing with my top off for a little while and only because it's Susan's birthday. Right, Susan? Happy birthday to you. Yay! Get excited. Um, notice Coach Sarah, I do not expect you to partake. I expect you to hold the camera and stream while we do it. When it comes to um, being out there, when your legs start to feel a little tired, the strides or accelerators or one-by-ones are a really good way to kind of wake them up and keep going. Um, they have a way, strides, as you've seen from the stride sandwich over and over again, they have a way, once you're fit enough to really capitalize on them, um, they have a way of making your legs feel fresh. And then you're holding back on the second part of the run instead of, um, and holding back meaning like you want to go faster because you can, not slowing down because you have to because your heart rate is now completely out of control. And that's a great a place to be. Like you guys are all steady and stable and fit as fuck. And congratulations on that. So don't lose sight of that. Have, be prepared though for the rest of your runs. And I know it's already been a bit of a mind fuck because you're all overachievers and we're used to hard work feeling good or having a sense of satisfaction that comes from a really hard workout. Thing is, set, do you get a feeling of satisfaction from one uh, one off hard workout? That feeling of satisfaction is not a guarantee that you're gonna have after every hard workout. Um, if you can walk away from a hard workout feeling a sense of accomplishment, then you've got what you needed. Um, walking, that feeling good is a sense of accomplishment. It's not a sense of physically feeling good or mentally feeling good or much less liking the run. There's very little enjoyable. Remember, I'm the person who has said clearly and consistently from the day you met me, I do not like doing one thing continuously for longer than five hours which is not to make fun of marathoners that are slower than that. It's not to make fun of ultra marathoners who are categorically longer than that. It does not interest me. I also really like vanilla ice cream. I'm weird like that, but I don't beat up on people who like chocolate. So it's just a preference. I do not want to do one thing continuously for more than five hours ever, and it's why I didn't run the New York City Marathon. That was going to take me five and a half hours. I was like, nope, nope. If I'm out there for five and a half hours and I'm only getting marathon, I'd rather wait and do a marathon when I can do it in under five hours. If, um, and by the way, have I mentioned I'm not doing another ultra? Because I'm not doing another ultra. Because those all take longer than five hours. So you see, it's not about judging what other people do. That Because it's not about the pace. It really is about the time. I don't want to do. So you are already, by getting up this morning and doing that egregiously long, long run, you are already, by definition, doing something that I will probably not ever do again if I can possibly help it or avoid it. Um, but I digress. Give yourself some credit for that. I am doing something hard. I am doing something long. I am doing something ridiculous. And make, let that be what makes you feel good. 
Like th there, there is no expectation that you're going to finish a run feeling strong or feeling anything other than I am done running for the day, right? <laughs> but you're not because you have a second long run later tonight. And that's important and that's what I want you to remember. It's easy when we start talking about a race plan, you guys, it's very hard to break the mentality. What's my magic number, coach? My magic number, the number I'm going to run the whole time. Is it okay if I stop and get water? Do I have to like speed up again to catch up time? And I'm like, whoa, what are you talking about? You are not a robot. You are not going to do this. And that's okay. There is no ultra on the planet where all the participants don't stop to walk. Even the people who win the ultras, the big ones, there are points and places where they have to walk either to consume fuel or to drink water or to poop. Like you're probably, you might have to do that. And that's all, that's all good. That's expected. It'd be weird if you did. So that's another reason I know a lot of people that won't do ultras because they don't like public toilets or pooping in the woods. I respect that. I'm one of those people. Guess where five hours came from? So to that, to that acknowledgement, and there are lots of us, it's not just me, I'm not like trying to like pretend that I'm all people, but there's a large contingency of people like me who tried and ultimately left ultra running for that reason. Some places you have to, some parks really want you to carry, or some people who run um, and, and take nature extremely seriously is like, you know, they, they expect you to dedicate in a baggie and carry that, with, carry that shit with you to the next time you see a trash can. And I, I just, mm -mm. I've, I've run with plenty of those people. There's, there are many aspects to ultra running and trail running in specific environments that I have no interest in doing ever again. Um, yay, marathons. Yay for cities. Yay for porta potties. Yay for finishing a race so quickly I don't need to use a porta potty ever. Whoop! So that, that's really kind of what it all comes down to. And we'll see what this race brings for you. You will probably have to stop for water. You will probably have to stop for food. You will probably have to stop to pee or poop. Except that, that's not being weak. That's, I mean, if you're going to beat yourself up for that, I got nothing for you. You need a therapist, not a coach, because that's insane. Congratulations on being human. Our robot orb overlords are not here yet. Way, way to survive another day. So when we think about what we need to get out of our runs this month, because the situation runs are starting and the two days. What I mean by situation run um, is like we need to be practicing different situations on those two days. Go out for your, sec go out for your first run of the day at, at noon. Wait until the sun's at its peak and then do your five-hour run. Yes, you're going to be missing your family on a Sunday afternoon, one of them. But you're also going to learn invaluable information about how to fuel and how to keep going and how to get started again when it's really hot outside and you don't feel good. That might have your second run of the day happening either first thing in the morning and then going back to bed and then doing your long run second. That's fine. That works for me. Um, but I want you to get to understanding a lot of different things. Number one, and because this one gets people, no matter, I can never convince people this is a really big deal, but it's a really big deal. And it's a bigger deal the longer that you're out there and the more your body's having to fight to maintain homeostasis. And that's temperature changes. So the delta on, on temperature, like just from in Denver right now, the sun rose and it was 44 degrees. And that was almost three hours ago when the sun rose. So now it is close to 60 out there, but in the sun, it feels much hotter. And that real feel is going to be rising over the course of the day. So if you look at a temperature and say like what temperature is in Denver right now, it's probably going to say something like 58. But if you ask my runners that are out there doing a long run in the middle of nowhere, they're going to, or not in the middle of nowhere, they're in city park and I'm dressed because I'm going to go meet them when they finally work their happy asses back to Wash Park. Um, if you look at the, at the weather channel, it's going to say it's 58 degrees. If you ask them, they're going to say it's in the mid-60s. And when they get to me, finally, and I go join them for my recovery miles, it's, going to be, it's probably going to feel like, it's going to feel, it's going to be awful. But if they don't feel love, they just don't want to be, Jesus Christ. I could be going to my run right now and get that shit over with before it gets hot. But it's going to feel like it's in the high 70s. An hour and a half from now when they show up. So, and that is what the sort of thing you need to be prepared for at the very least. Because I would hate, nothing new on race day is the idea. And I do not want you to be acknowledging the temperature shifts as the sun rises and as the sun sets again for the first time on race day. So do that egregiously long, long run in the middle of the day. Because I know most of us avoid that heat because it doesn't feel good. We don't want to get sunburned. Um, and it slows us the fuck down. And who wants to run really, really slowly in hot, hot sun? 
we need to do it at least once if we can just to again get used to the idea of when I'm really hot and I don't feel good I'm not hungry and I don't want to oh I'm not hungry because I don't feel good and I definitely don't want to drink anything either and if you've got some of that going on that is really going to be hurting later when and you're not going to have perfect answers to every question by race day but if we're thinking about it we're winning because when those temperature changes that's going to impact fuel because over time the longer that you're out there your stomach's going to be shrinking there's going to be less energy available to digesting food it's going to be de dedicated towards cooling you off and keeping you moving forward and what you can absorb quickly is going to be is going to mimic sugar now the more sugary something is the faster your body's going to absorb it but the more sugary something is or the, the, the more glucosey it is the more likely your body is to totally reject it outright and vomit and that <coughs> yeah I hate spring and that we really need to avoid so the impact that the temperature changes over time is going to have on your fueling strategy maybe you start the day eating solid food and you end the day drinking tailwind maybe you start with you can I mean I'm not a huge fan of you can but it has a carbohydrate in it and has a starch in it and it's long and slow burning maybe you start with epic bars and you can and over the course of the day maybe when you get to noon when it's really hot you have a sandwich and you get and or and you get rid of the of the starchy sugary drink and go straight water or and then finally in the middle of the afternoon you're back to sugar I don't really care what the answer is I care that you're thinking about it and that you're having and that you have an idea of no it's really hot right now I can't have that coke I'm waiting until sunset or yay you know what I don't feel so good right now I think I would rather have a banana than the peanut butter sandwich or you know what can someone run to the deli for me and just get some sliced turkey Not, nothing that I have is working for me I'll be there with a the car I can do that that's half the reason I'm going is to support you guys and that's what a crew literally does it's not abnormal so no that is not useful thank you so much Facebook and Facebook and Google have started doubling up on all my notifications and I'm like I hate it Google is not helpful at all so the high level so that the temperature changes how that impacts fueling and hydration and this don't go down a, a rabbit hole of science about hydration a lot of science exists right now because you know I've said it for a long time it has been widely known that dehydration impacts performance and uh, we, as we saw in the Rio Olympics that was the kickstart to where people started really caring not just normal people but corporations thinking what can I sell to the average person that will make them now that they're aware that hydration is a thing and that water loss is a thing maybe they want to track maybe moms in Florida want to chat want to track hydration and water loss on their children while they're during afternoon hot summer football and soccer practices maybe um, ultra runners want to have an idea that are training for them, the marathon de sub one of the, the race across the Sahara maybe they want to be able to monitor their water loss in different conditions to better prepare for the event itself that's not a bad idea there are a lot of lateral applications and a lot of uh, uses for um, hydration strategies and if you start googling it you can easily slide face first down the rabbit hole of hydration strategies that don't really apply to you and don't really matter I don't need you tracking your rate of water loss the evaporative nature of sweat on your skin over time the most important things when it, more specialization does not always lead to better outcomes especially in an event that's really want to be one and done so what you need to know is this the longer that you're out there the more the rate of water loss starts to accelerate and it doesn't like ex increase at an increasing rate exponentially to like all of a sudden you know you you are you know dried fruit leather on the side of the road but and your body is never going to be able to process more than four cups of water per hour because the limiting factor there are your kidneys and that is how much they can process per hour when we talk about like having your your Nathan on and just sipping continuously that's it but don't force it if you're forcing water down don't force water down unless I've looked you in the eyes had a conversation and said hey okay I'm worried now drink more water Put this put that put that camel back put the Nathan straw in your mouth and do not take it out for the rest of this lap I'm gonna run behind you topless if you do don't do that 
don't do that, don't make me do that, I don't want to do that. So mind that four cups of water per hour and just keep that somewhere in the back of your head. Um, the, uh, the, and the final thing that I really care about because, I mean, it's the, I, I like to think of it as gumption. Grit has, uh, it has a connotation that I, I, I think has gotten ugly now where we talk about like either you've got grit or you're a pansy. And it's like, well, I toughed it out because I got grit. It's like, you tore your knee. You kept running on a bad ligament that was screaming at you. You tore your MCL by yourself. That's not grit. That's the fucking movie Saw. Like, that is not okay. So we've gritted a little too far. Gumption is something a little... I like, I like the term because it's a little softer and it's a little different. Um, and gumption is just like doing something that's hard. It's not forcing something that's hard. Y'all chose to be here. No one is forcing you to run this terrible event. Susan is just really persuasive. She's a silver-tongued devil. But she has not forced anyone to do anything. So where gumption comes into play, it's that second run of the day. It's running when you don't want to. It's getting up and going when you don't want to anymore. It serves basically no physiological purpose. That doesn't make it irrelevant. This is what it's for. You've been getting up and going so many times in this training cycle, at times you didn't want to, on days you didn't want to, that on race day, it'll be easier just to keep going because it's all over tomorrow. I don't have to start again after tomorrow. And there's something freeing about that that I think is going to carry you through the event. So this, when we, th when we talk about dress rehearsal and what's going on, we, I want you trying different clothing and dealing with different temperatures and temperature changes over the day so you have an idea of what you need. It's five o'clock in the evening. The sun is setting. The sun, it has not set, but it's setting. It's one of the hottest points of the day. Let's say it's not humid at all that day. The humidity is low, like 10, 15%. You come running around to me and your eyes are glazed over. You're stumbling a little bit. Um, and I ask you how you feel and you say, I'm really cold. The cues to me there are you're not actually cold, you're super dehydrated, and we might need to take you off and let you take a little bit of a nap, and then in an hour or so, after you feel a little bit more, get back up and keep going. This is not a luxury afforded to most ultra runners. If that happens in a race, you're usually being pulled out and told that you can no longer continue. It is seen as, because it's seen as a punitive thing, people will fight through it. It's not punitive here, and I'm really glad this race does it because, you know, this isn't Chamonix. We don't, this is not the World Championships of Ultra Running. Um, you are here to do, get as many miles as you can, hopefully 50, out of a 24-hour race. And if you're stumbling towards me, hot, dehydrated, feeling hot to the touch, but swearing that you're cold and you want a sweater, that's a pretty good cue that we need to take you off, cool you down. We'll wrap you up in a blanket just to make you feel a little bit better while I then rub a cool cloth on your head and bring you back, bring your body back to a sense of homeostasis, and when you feel like you can go back out, then you do. It's not, but if you come to me and say, exact, in that exact scenario, and say, what I need, no, 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 what I need is a jacket, I'm going to be like, the fuck you do, and you're going to have to listen to me. So there are a lot of things that can go wrong and can't fall apart beyond, beyond this point. It's my job to know most of those things, and that's why I'm showing up, and that's why I'm coming there in the afternoon. Um, I'm not exactly sure what time yet. It depends on what time I can beg off and get away from uh, my, my, graduate, my, my reunion, which, granted, I mean, I do want to be there, and I'm missing the big festivities in the evening, but um, I'm going to be there for Friday night, Saturday morning, then Saturday, Saturday noon there's a luncheon, um, and then I'll be grabbing Sarah Axelrod, and we'll be driving up from there. So I ex I'm fully expecting to be there between 3 and 6 p.m. Um, I'm not exactly sure yet, but that's the window that I'm kind of targeting personally right now is between 3 and 6 p.m. on Saturday. And then if everyone is under control and if everything is okay and if I feel like I can afford to, and that's why I haven't, that's why I haven't registered yet. I'm still like on the fence. Do I buy the bib and potentially not run? Do I not buy the bib and just plan to support? Um, we'll see. I, either way, I'm going to be there. And sorry, I mean, I'm, I, I go back and forth about this a lot. I don't think the worst case scenario is going to present, but I'm fully prepared to buy a bib and then not run if one of y'all is hurting and you need not direct medical attention, but a little bit of coaching and loving. That's what I'm there to do. So, but all of that kind of stop, starts, we can avoid that if you've been running in the middle of the day in really hot temperatures, know what to wear and know what to fuel 
and then we have an idea of like we can prevent things from going really really wrong by 5 p.m. if we make good choices or have an idea of what bad choices are and avoid those between noon and 4 p.m. which is really reasonably the hottest window of the day um, most of the time so that is what I wanted to communicate that's where we are can you believe we're, we're already gone through all of this crazy the final piece and I'm sorry I didn't get back to you guys earlier this week on it um, but I don't know if you heard yesterday was the 20th uh, anniversary of Columbine Columbine um, if for the uninitiated was a school shooting in 1999 committed by Dylan Harris I'm uh, sorry Eric Harris and Dylan Klebold his uh, Dylan's mother Sue has a wonderful TED talk that's worth listening to if, you, if you're the parent of teenagers right now um, or if you're impacted by this tragedy in any form or fashion but it was it was kind of emotional and we had an active shooter um, that was allegedly obsessed with Columbine um, that we get a lot of tourists that come to see and touch Columbine which is you know it's, it's a school y'all it's not a tourist attraction but people treat it like one um, and on Wednesday the met there's a massive manhunt for this woman who uh, had legally procured firearms and had made uh, credible threats against a couple of the schools so they shut the whole school system down um, and that was hard on most of my friends some of the people that I'll be meeting to, to run in a few minutes and whenever they get here they're Columbine survivors they were there um, I my it was hard on my kids so it ended up being a, and a couple of emotional like silly little petty things that happened on Monday and Tuesday and then continued on Thursday and Friday because a lot of people didn't know how big of a week it was for us here in Denver um, and I don't think I was a, I realized I was not emotionally a lot of what I do is emotional labor and I was not emotionally equipped to handle all of what my family needed all of what my friends needed and all of what my clients required during what turned out to be a very 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 intense week so sorry I've been um, off the radar a little bit and I'm sorry I didn't get this to you sooner but now the ultra plyo um, we're kind of done with that like we can you we can if you really like it and you want to keep doing it once a day that's cool you may um, I don't really feel the need for you to though so I would like you to continue the arm circuit up until May the 1st let's do the arm circuit for two more weeks and then here we're going to cut we're going to cut out the arms okay now again this is important because you're going to be as you've seen from your four your egregiously long four hour five hour six hour long runs that your the tendons here get really tight and really sore especially if you roll your shoulders forward like I tend to do when wearing water pack it's another reason I don't wear the water pack uh, again if I can possibly avoid it not saying you need to do what I do I'm saying my shoulders roll forward when I run when I run with the backpack and it that hunch um, is not I, I, I personally can't stop doing it it's almost instinctual um, so I just it's better either rather than retrain my instincts I'm just like I'm gonna try to run without water and that's where I'm at so the arm circuit we're gonna continue for now for like that's what two more weeks when it comes to strength I'm good <clears throat> to move flat into maintenance mode because you guys have got plenty I have not heard um, none of you are injured none of you are complaining about injuries none of you are complaining about soreness that gives me any reason to doubt your ankles or your hips or the stability um, your foundation uh, of your chassis as a whole so knowing that your body's in a pretty good place we're just going to try to maintain it with um, number one the arm circuit and then number two and I call this Willy Wonka because it's gonna feel like candy after all the work that you've done it'll be like yay so if you don't do this super short circuit that I'm about to give you then fuck you but you really need to do this really short candy type circuit after all the work that you've been doing okay so number one monster walks personally I would do these before the run um, only because we're activating the muscles and by, by continually activating the muscles um, you're going to be recruiting them while you do the run itself 
So we, we can't really, we don't have any time left to build any more strength, and we don't really need to. We just need to leverage what you've already got. Um, and not lose your mind, since I know a lot of you have been losing your minds for a while on all this work. But it's what's required, really, to sail through this event. When you see what people do when they get there, when you see what their race plan is, when you see any of the choices and the decisions that they make, you are going to feel so rock solid in who you are and your training and what you've done. And, you're, and it's also going to be a super easy transition to the next thing, which is that 100K in the middle of Vermont. Thanks, Susan. Um, so one is the monster walks. I'm not going to demonstrate all this. I'm just writing it down. So Willy Wonka is a loop circuit. And the final piece, and again, I know, I know this is a lot, and hopefully you're already doing this anyway. Um, when you brush your teeth, and this is just an easy way to squeeze it all in, because hopefully you're brushing your teeth twice a day. Please try to do it barefoot, balancing on one leg. Why the F does that matter? Well, it's an easy way to slide it into your routine because hopefully it's something you're doing anyway. And if you read any of the articles that I put in my Nizzle newsletter today, that balance aspect is really important. So that way you're standing there barefoot, brushing your teeth, do, B, C, D, E, F, G, that this leg is moving a little bit and you're finding that stability, not from your toes, because remember, if you're standing on one foot and you feel wobbling happen, the instinct is to tighten your ankle, tighten your calf, and crunch your toe in the shoe. And the where stability comes from is actually right here. So A, B, C, D, E, F, and that has to be trained. So when I was first starting to do this coming back after pregnancy, I would literally, as a reminder, just kind of grab my booty, standing on one leg, A, B, C. If I make my kids sing off that song, make sure that they're... They brush their teeth long enough. Yay! Aren't you glad you don't live in my house? So remembering that this is what a glute firing does. And when you fire the glute, it sets off an entire chain. You, can, you can't just isolate and twitch that one leg, that, that one part of your leg. The quad is going to fire. The calf is going to fire. It does reverberate all the way down to your feet. Please, for the love of God, do this barefoot. You will get that proprioceptive training, that good balance training. The reason I put you all on a BOSU ball in the first place way back when with the Train Like a Mother programs um, it was, I didn't do that lightly and I didn't do it because I thought it would be fun to make you guys buy these things and expect you not to use them. I did them because I thought it would be fun. I bet they'll do it. Hell, we'll see what else I can get them to do. Um, but yeah, Willy Wonka, I would add this. I would do the, I would do 30 seconds on each foot, totally barefoot, doing, during something simple like brushing your teeth or, you know, waiting in line at the Starbucks where you probably don't want to take your shoes up at the Starbucks. Brush your damn teeth, do some damn balance. When it comes to the Willy Wonka series, if, by the way, you are still not feeling strong enough, and you're like, wait, we got coach, I just want a little bit more, what can I do? There's one final circuit that I can give you. I don't think you need it. But if you want it, I will give it to you. Otherwise, the type of strength we are going to do will resume after three days at the fair, because the strength that I want you to have is going to be more appropriate to climbing all the hills that you're going to, right now we're not even training for hill stuff, we're just getting you strong, now we got to get you strong and moving in multiple planes of motion and rock solid in multiple planes of motion instead of just one. So, when it comes to monster walks, we want a little bit of a bend in the knee, it's not a squat, right, it's just a little bit, we don't want your knees totally locked out, a little bit of a bend, like this. In, and then pushing out. So with every step, it's part one, shifting the weight, lift the foot, it comes in, presses out and forward. Like that, okay? Those are monster walks. 
And we want to do those, by the way, 30 seconds going forward. The number of steps doesn't matter. The distance doesn't really matter. 30 seconds forward, 30 seconds backward. Backwards harder, you're going to find your ankle collapsing inward with every step. Resist that and remember to turn your glutes on. That means you hold your booty. I don't really care. I care that we don't see any of this. Okay. So that's, the, that's step one, that's the monster walk. Step two, side slides. These aren't big moves, they're teeny tiny moves. 30 seconds in each direction. And what this is intended to do is just maintain your glute meat and your glute bin on the side, recruit them for activation. Watch this from the front, people get this wrong all the time, it just hurts my feelings. Lead with the, with the hip, pull the body. Lead with the hip, pull the body. I don't want to see any of this, right? I don't want any, either of your knees. I would rather you lock your knees um, on this move than on the monster walks. Monster walks, we need a little bit of a bend. We can afford to be locked out. Um, not like tight locked out, but we can afford to be locked out on the side slides. Tiny step, pull forward from the nose slack. Adding tightness, pull the slack. Adding tightness, pull the slack. Plant, pull. Plant, pull. Where people go wrong here is again, they sort of like lean their body sideways. Uh, uh, and it turns into a dance. Do, 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 do. That's not what we want. We just want that hip planted, pull. Plant, pull. Not big steps. These are teeny tiny motions for teeny tiny muscles. And if this burns, great. That's a cue. If you feel this burning down your IT band, let's talk about that. Because <laughs> it probably really shouldn't be by this point. Um, but it's a good thing we're doing this if that's something that you feel. And the answer to that, by the way, is more clamshell. You got more cowbell? I got more clamshell. Step, pull. Step, pull. Step, pull. Okay, so we want to do 30 seconds to the left, 30 seconds to the right. I already did that longer than I expect you to. So the side plank with the dips. Who the fuck does not feel strong enough? My legs are like Juju. Your legs are amazing, Julie. All right, I'll do the, the fourth one. Though. I guess if you want to do this third and do the side planks last, that's 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 fine. I don't really care. Um, they're in this order for a reason, and that's the order of activation. Um, but the soldier marches. I want you having the, the loop around your feet and then pulling upward. This is a, another one that's really good to do barefoot. Um, the only reason I'm not is because I fully expected to meet my runners <laughs> before this whole thing started. Um, so I was ready to walk out the door and I'm like, oh, it's going to take you a while. I'll just stream. By the time I finish this stream, you'll probably be back in Wash Park. I'm uh, so standing on one foot, putting a little bit of a bend. Not like, because again, we don't want this locked out. Locking out is a really good way to tear up your ACL and your MCL, and we don't want to start doing that. Make sure your glute is activated, your booty's on, and that you're using your hip flexor to pull this foot up. The reason that this is so good barefoot is that we add the stabilizer muscles in your quad on your standing leg while training the hip flexor on this side. It's really phenomenally better, even if you have more trouble doing it, that's a good thing. You're going to need those stabilizer muscles later for the trails, but it's not bad to start developing them now. 30 seconds on each side. Make sure that glutey, the glutey, your glutey is tight. And that all of the pull is coming from right here. This is pulling, this is balancing. Get that side view. Dorsiflex while you pull up. Okay. Pull this one down. Do, 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 do. And this is all we're going for here. To so keep this nice, nice and loaded. Load it in. Thirty seconds on each side, 
And again, that is for this, as well as uh, the little glutes on the side. While I'm here, and you're here, do you have any questions? If not, that's fine. I'll be back later for Ask the Coach. Very sorry I did not get this to you sooner. But yay, Julie. See why I call it Willy Wonka? Isn't that going to feel like candy after all that you've been doing? And you don't have to do this um, at before every single run since you're doing two a days. Do it before whatever the biggest run of the day is. So on a day where you have a two-hour stride sandwich and an hour easy in the, in the evening, do it before the two-hour stride sandwich. I'm completely indifferent to when you do it, but this is all for continued maintenance and activation. So with that in mind, I would do it before the biggest run of the day. But if you don't, it's not a tragedy. Just do it before the next one and you're fine. Remember, we're doing so much. Getting one little thing, doing one little thing differently, forgetting it now and again or getting it wrong, it's a drop in the very, very, very big bucket, 50 fucking miles. You're gonna be fine. Your coach, your love, you're winning at life, your legs are like tree trunks, your ass is like a big old ripe peach. And actually an unripe peach, a fresh peach. You are fresh peaches, Julie. How good is that? So that's pretty much all I had to say, but I'm sure Susan will find a hundred ways to be confused and ask questions. Because that's what she does. She makes me work harder, makes me better. Pull this forward. Yes, yay! So Sharpener has us doing sprints. My PT has said no sprints. Can I do big girl pickups instead? Fuck yeah. Of course. Of course. So sharpeners um, are, the whole idea there is like just to get used to, again, doing things when you're tired and to sharpen up. Um, so sharpeners is the sort of workout that I would, t I would have my elites do before a marathon. Um, but most of us that aren't getting six, um, pulling six minute miles at 1.30, um, then we really don't need to sharpen. We just need to strengthen. Once, um, so sharpening is what I have people do. Um, that are about to race an aggressive shorter distance like a 5k or a 10k. Um, it's not that they don't have value for longer distances, it's just the purpose that they serve. Um, what I'm trying to uh, accomplish here is number one, getting an idea of what too hard is um, and that you don't have to do that on race day ever. And I know that you know that, but it's one thing to know and it's another thing to feel it because it's the mind fuck is going to happen when you're out there and there are like 10 other people that are near you. Because, um, I mean, the vast majority of the race is going to be done. It starts at 9. Most of the folks are going to be done by 2 p.m. And that's why I'm aiming to be there between 3 and 6 p.m. Because it's going to be the hottest point of the day. And you'll have the marathoners should be finishing and dropping off the course. And who is left but the proud, the few, the fucked. You guys. So I want to be there to mentally and physically support you during that period because it's going to be really, really, really hard. You're going to feel alone. Um, and the few people you see, you're going to feel the need to catch up to and pass because that is so deeply ingrained in most of our brains that it's not about one foot in front of the other. It's going to be about what am I doing relative to the other 10 people that are still on this course. So by doing the sharpeners now, um, if ever, I want that, that feeling ingrained in your mind so that when you're out there, you don't fall into that trap and work harder than you have to at any given point, especially during the hardest point of the day. Um, hopefully, I mean, we need to coordinate at some point before we go. I'm planning on either bringing, if Shara doesn't have a tent that I can borrow, she doesn't strike me as the camping type of family. Um, and uh, neither, neither does Sarah Axelrod, no offense, Beth Pretty might be. Um, I, wanna, I, need to, I need to reach out to everyone and just coordinate on um, what they're bringing because if we have like a really big, um, a really big tent, that is going to be helpful, not in the afternoon because you'll just be out of the shade. That thing is going to feel like a, like a pressure cooker if you crawl inside it for a nap. So I want to make sure we have like lots of good options to actually cool people off that are going to be around. And a way for you guys to feel some relief. That RV that that that, um, that we're talking about running, um, that that too can feel like a hot box, real easy. So creating and maintaining shade is going to be important. Um, there are different ways that we're going to do that. 
um, or at least with different ways that I'm planning on doing that. So, but we'll, we'll discuss kind of all that uh, when we get there, and I'm on a tangent now, sorry for that. So my sharpening has us doing sprints, right? So Willy Wonka before the run with silly toes and the other drills. Yes, I would do the silly toes first, um, and then you don't have to do the hip openers other than right before the egregiously long or egregiously hard runs. If you enjoy them and you find them helpful, you can do them, um, but you don't, I'm not gonna compel you to do them any longer. Um, right now we're just going into, not the bare essentials, but while we get into, I would rather you took more time to really think about what you're doing and learn from the runs than stress out anymore about how to get in all the other stuff. Add this, I don't care if it's before or after the silly toes, I would personally do them after silly toes, and I would probably cut the hip openers um, on every run other than the longest run of the week or the hardest run of the week if I felt like my hips need them. I think they're probably, you love them and now it's a habit, then keep doing them, keep doing them. I'm just thinking of like, you know, Kate Walton has a really hard job. She has like a really stressful job. Like, I don't know how she does this and has like a super duper big girl job. I have no idea how you do this and have a super duper big girl job. But I also know that this is, um, you know, poor Kate feels like she's pulled in a million directions and I wanted to sort of pull some things aside or make more things optional um, at this point, as many things optional as I can. And if you want to opt into those hip openers, by all means keep doing it. Um, if Kate's hip was going to present an issue, it would have happened by now. So since it has not yet, uh, and I know she's been doing much of the work, I am comfortable kind of letting the hip openers go for the general populace. Um, really there, and I'm sure y'all could guess she was really the weak link, and I wanted to make sure, I mean not the weak link, but that hip of hers, um, I wanted to make sure it, it remains stable, and the best way to do that is through having the most dynamic warm-up possible. If you see in my Nuzzle newsletter on, on the Coach MK or Fitness Protection, one of the two, I posted this link to the Denver Broncos Strength and Conditioning Coach. Um, I was saying the best thing that you can do is develop core strength in your athletes and have them doing dynamic warm-up drills. Well, you guys are doing about 20 minutes of dynamic warm-ups, just like the Denver Broncos do every single day just like Steph Bruce Rothstein does every single day. You guys are doing all of the things when you're doing them well. Keep what you want, what you want. Toss what you, you know, don't feel like doing anymore. I would, I would recommend keeping up with the arms just because we don't want to lose what's going on in your shoulder and feel the bite on race day because that does get really painful. And um, activating the muscles that we've spent all this time developing and we're going to be hitting all of those main muscle groups um, with this and by practicing the balance we're just going to be maintaining uh, a little bit more of that instinctual proprioceptive training while maintaining all the strength that we've built in your ankles over time no matter what shoe you're wearing so that's what I'm thinking of there if you have more questions let me know if, if you love but if you love those hip openers you can keep you can totally keep doing them um, but adding this in shouldn't add very much to it because we're going to be cutting out pretty much the other strength and all the ultra plyo. Yay! If there's nothing else, I will be around for Ask the Coach tonight. Uh, starting at 5, what did I say, 5 p.m.? I think I put them all on at 5 p.m. At 5 p.m. Mountain Time, uh, you are coached, you are loved. Let's keep winning with what little time we have left. And it really isn't that much time at all. Two weeks um, in April and then two weeks in May. Four weeks total and then race week itself so you guys have done amazing things I still cannot believe how well you have adhered to the plan uh, one final thing and I'll, I'll just draw this out and I'll talk about it more tonight but something that I would go back at the longest run you've done recently so Julie I think if you're still here that would have been the run you did yesterday the five hours and five hours and 45 minutes I'm mashing up. <laughs> Terrible. If you go into the Training Peaks app, you can scroll. You go into, at the top, you'll see like summary, feed, map, laps. Go into the laps portion, and you'll see a bunch of graphs that look like this. Peak heart rate, and it looks like something like over time. So if this peak heart rate, this will be something like 180 for five seconds. And then here it's, it's 
five seconds, two minutes, 60 minutes. Okay, so the reason this exists is that, um, and I never talk about this for very good reason if I discuss this in any of the bigger, broader training, virtual online DIY training programs, um, my office hours would have been flooded with calls of analyze my data and like with no one really willing to pay me to do it for them. Um, and no one really willing to do the work to do all the reading to figure it out for themselves. So the way that we use this, the, the way that I use these charts, so the workouts that I call uh, or I consider to be a key workout, depending on the athlete, depending on the cycle, it's not like this is always a key workout for every person because it's not. Um, but that five hour and 45 minute um, is a key workout for another reason I hadn't talked about and that's the overall effort. The effort output for that five hour and 45 minute long run is roughly the same expenditure over time as I would expect from a nine hour event. Okay? So the numbers that come out of this chart and there are like nine charts and I could get into it right now except it's on my training peaks app here and I'm using this to stream um, I'm gonna have a different setup and I'll talk I'll address this a little bit more later but what you'll see um, is that over time it shows you like let's say that's 180 and then here it's 175 for one minute and here it's 170 for two minutes and then it's like 138 so the two key things that I'm kind of thinking about is that where, where training goes wrong, if you've ever heard that logic like, I'm gonna train for a really fast 5K or a mile and then I'm gonna train for the marathon again. <laughs> and what they do, because what they're trying to do is gain this number. Because they're trying, by training for a fast 5K or a fast mile, you are shooting your power output and your max heart rate through the roof, hoping to gain this number, this result at the end, which is theoretical. So what happens is that you like, well, if I'm training for a 5K, I don't really need to do all this running and I don't need to do all these long runs. So your running volume decreases and you get shorter, you get more powerful, but that power doesn't translate into distance over time because you've gotten rid of the other two variables. You've traded it all off for power. So these numbers would not be valid for the vast population of people that I train in virtual online programs and that's why I don't talk about them. You can go and you've also heard me say, Anyone can run one really fast mile, but that don't tell me if they're prepared to even start marathon training. This is what I'm talking about. And if you can game any of these systems any way you want to to get the, that result that you want, but getting that result that you want in a graph that has zero predictive capabilities versus race day, those are two discrete, mutually exclusive concepts. So, right now, this is about as accurate as it's ever gonna be for you guys as a predictive force going into race day and not for finish time for step-by-step -step execution throughout the race the real race plan what I get out of this is at the end of this it's probably going to have something like three hours for at this point for you I probably should have looked before I started the stream but I thought I was going to be running and my runners aren't here it might even be because your longest runs have been so long it might actually be closer to five hours. What it's telling you, and let's say over five hours, it's 138. That you can easily hold this, and remember, because we've been cramming all of that extra intensity into here, instead of five hours, we can read that as nine. So this is me gaming the system to give you something to play with. You're welcome. So over the course of nine hours, you can sustain a heart rate of 138 very easily. So the higher you are over it in the beginning, the harder it is to come back to this baseline um, when the day is long and you're done and you're tired. Now it won't necessarily be as low as 138, it might be 155, it might be 150. It's different for every person and it's very hard to tell. Um, but this, if you go and look at these charts, you can see this is where the race plan starts to fall out with my high level athletes, um, of which I would definitely call the unicorns uh, that are doing the 50 mile, 50 fucking miles. Y'all are high level, you're high volume, high everything, which means all of this is a lot more accurate and has a lot more predictive capabilities. So when you go into peak heart rate, it'll tell you like the highest heart rate you could expect to hold over time. 
right? Which doesn't mean you can't run harder than this number ever throughout the race. It just means, you know, when I did that marathon and I said what I, what I did with the big triangle the other day, and I said for a 5K, you know, you I you're want to start in this band down here, end at the band up here, and the average is somewhere in the middle, and the average for a 5K is somewhere between 170 and 175. And for a 10K, it's around one, 162 for me to 170. And then for you know half marathon and then a marathon, a half marathon, I really expect the average to be somewhere between um, 162 and 168. And then the marathon, I want the average to be no higher than 162 at the end. Anything over 162, and I'm probably gonna, um, that, if I am over 162, sooner than halfway into the race, I probably need to slow my roller. I'm gonna have to walk. I really need to moderate that effort. That's how I read that number, okay? It's not about like holding one thing continuously over time because you're not a robot and you never will. It's about regression to the mean, regression to the mean, coming back to your baseline, regression to the mean. And the mean in a marathon is 162. Remember, I had all that wind in my face and it slowed me down and my average heart rate at Philadelphia was 159. Okay, well this, this series was where all those numbers came from. It's from this series of graphs that you have right now, as accurate as they will ever be, for the longest and most difficult run you've done, which for you, Julie, was the one you did yesterday. Go in there, see the peak heart rate, and I'll tell you, over time, you've got more than you think you do. It's, let, it's changed a lot because you're more powerful than you were before, and we haven't really tapped into that power. That power is going to come to play on race day, and all of these numbers will be higher than you expect them to be, which is why I say that's not like you can't, be hard, you can't have a heart rate higher than 138. It just means over about halfway into the race, that's when we're going to start relying on the, and tapping into these power reserves, and uh, you're going to have more energy to work harder. Does that make any sense, or am I just saying words? The next one to look at is peak pace. And Tam has a stride, the stride pod for your foot. I'm not saying you guys need to go buy one. Same goes for power. A lot of us are, it makes sense. All right, so a lot of us, like I've been training with this pod on my foot right here. It's called a stride. And I'm getting something that says peak power. And so and it's the same thing. Is we're just trying to look for one continuous power at wattage output over time. Um, you know, backing off when I'm going up a hill. It's probably the most steady variable that we have. Um, because it adjusts for, you know, if, if your power output is 244, that's a, that's a whole lot of power. And if you're doing, in a 5K, maybe you can sustain it, but not longer than, not for the duration of a 10K. So we kind of dial that number in. It has more predictive qualities than other numbers do. Um, the others, I think, just give us a really good set of guidelines, like, don't open that door, don't go in, but in there. Peak pace is going to look the same, and because all these charts are on top of each other and they all look the same, it's really easy to overlook them and misunderstand the value that they bring to the table. So the peak pace, let's say your five second, again, this is, this is like pace over time. Let's say for five seconds, you can hold on to, and this was all going to be based off that hardest workout, the five hour and 45. So let's say the, the fastest pace that you, you hit in that workout um, translated into uh, a peak pace of seven minutes. So you can hold seven minutes per mile for five seconds. And then you're going to have a sharp drop, and that'll be your two minute. And let's say your two minute peak pace is like a 715. And then it's going to like come down, and then there'll be another big drop off, and then a slow easing over time. So remember, this is going to say five hours, but we're going to think of it as nine hours right over here. And that, whatever that peak pace number is, that is what we're probably, your average pace over the course of the event needs to, where you need to think about it, right? Again, it's an average. It doesn't mean you can't be harder. Just doesn't mean, just means you don't need to be working harder than that until 
later in the race when the work is hard no matter what you do. So that might be a 13 minute mile. So again, for context, when we all we talk about is pace and we don't talk about time and we don't talk about effort levels, we, I, it's, I say we miss the point. So is the biggest badass at Palmer Lake, the Palmer Lake death race, which happened last weekend, it's the one where that was snowing um, and was, was really fucked up in the ground, was like chocolate pudding, that point at eight, eight, eight tenths of a mile, eight tenths of a mile around that pond. Okay, is the winner the dude who ran the first lap in 549, not even a full mile, or is the winner the person that got 150 miles out of 24 hours? And that works out to a 1230, 1240 mile. So is the badass the person that had the power output a really high power output for a short period of time, or the endurance athlete that got 150 fucking miles out of 24 hours running a pace pretty close to what you're going to be running on race day. So we can demonize 13 minute miles and be like, I've done all this work, and I'm not saying you do or you will. We can demonize this number and be like, 13 minute miles. I'm such a loser. After all this work, I should be so much faster than that. My legs are here and my butt is here and I've just got muscles all over the place. Those muscles clearly don't work. And I can't squeeze them in my... It's easy to spin out about this number and then be like the Palmer Lake death race. The Palmer Lake death race. The winner. 150 miles in 24 hours running the same pace that I'm running now. That is the perspective I want to have running through your head. Instead of shaming this number... This is the number you can hold on to for 150 fucking miles or 24 fucking hours. You were coached. You were loved. You were winning at life if you remember that it's not about this number, but really about the perspective you bring to it. And you are badasses from hell. I cannot believe all you're doing. I cannot believe all the work that you've done. I cannot believe the work that you do for a living on a regular basis, Julie, much less all this that you've opted into on top of it and all the volunteer you do work you do um, for other organizations and other places. It, that, it blows my mind because you don't strike me as the neurotic type A. Type A stands for anxious, by the way, right? You're not the anxiety-driven people pleaser. You have never once struck me that way. You are actually doing, executing, and owning more work and better outcomes than most type A personalities ever will, and you don't seem crushed under the burden of it all. It's truly spectacular. And I hope that in the moments where you default back to old thinking patterns, or you think about like that higher power output, like yeah, they're faster for a couple of minutes. What's that worth? What's it worth to run one mile really quickly? I'm running 50 fucking miles steady as a rock, and you know what, I could probably go longer. And the truth of the matter is, most of you guys are going to get there, and you might be done, like mentally, physically, I'm, t I'm tapping out right now, I did what I came here to do, but if the question is, could you go longer, the answer is going to be yeah. Like, you were trained to run 50, 24 hours, because you've gotten everything you needed out of it, and that two-a-day, the situation around the two-a-day, the running when you don't want to run, running when it's the last thing you want to do, strengthening when you'd rather go to bed, sorry, the strength isn't up anymore, um, all of the things, like, for no good reason, against your will, against the odds, you have done them. This race is going to be about as sweet as, you know, Willy Wonka's Chocolate Factory. You won the whole damn thing. Especially if you were smart enough to look at that number, not assign a value to it, and just keep doing that work. Steady as a clock. All day long. And you will. Yay! I'm proud as fuck of you guys, by the way. I... I'm really glad we didn't develop a formal program, and that was not a popular, that, that, that got me in trouble, not going to lie, um, and understandably so. It, I can absolutely see how that could have been perceived as shady on my part, like I was trying to steal private clients from a big group, um, and that was never the intent. Um, it was after we got the group, it was all very organic, and you know, I know I'm honest, and that's all I can do is be like, I can look in the mirror and know that. Um, I did all this with integrity, but I look back at how much you have grown and how much you have changed. And by having a really small private group, the flexibility I was able to have as a coach 
to adapt and roll with you guys. Like, what I had originally sketched out for you guys to do after Rocky Raccoon is very different than what I actually legit gave you after Rocky Raccoon because you guys made more progress than I would have expected. You were all executing 100% of the plan and I had accounted for maybe 75 because it's holidays and things get hard. That's a lot and it's a lot and it's a lot and it adds up. You guys did all of the work and you got all of the results. And so the second part, I, when I went back to my planning and I had to like, scratch things out and start over and be like, well, they can actually handle this and they can actually handle this. That was such a beautiful, pleasant surprise that I love that we were able to do that and roll with the punches and really give you a program that has been tailored to not just your aptitude and your willingness to execute, but your capabilities. Like, you're really going to see what you're capable of. I think you might have got a glimpse of it at Rocky Raccoon, but you were really tired. You're, you're tenacious as fuck, and you're really about to see that in a brand new way, Julie, and I can't wait to show you. I really can't wait. Yay! Good stuff. Anyway, that's all. Enjoy the work while you have it, because the work that we're going to be having after three days at the fair is very, very different. Um, it's not going to be more. It's just going to be different. But that's it. I need to stop talking now. I've kept you way too long. Have a good one.